Um, our speaker tonight is Andy Griffiths. Um, and Andy, you were um, done some interesting things in Budapest um, and in Paris, um, but you're now vicar at Gallywood and area dean in Chelmsford South, um, with an interest in all sorts of things, but amongst them the Moravian tradition, and you studied them um, in some depth on a recent sabbatical. Um, so we're really delighted that you're here tonight um, to speak to us. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you very much. For that. Okay, so first of all, I'm not a Moravian. And you ought, therefore, to mistrust anything I say. That's true in general, I think, about people who say anything about a church that is not their own. It's also true when people speak about a church that is their own, you should mistrust that as well. But you should particularly mistrust people who say things about the Moravian movement and aren't Moravians, because there's an awful lot of people out there doing it. If you go to Herrnhut in southeast Germany, where the Moravians kind of started, or at least um, emanated from, you will discover all sorts of groups that have moved into Herrnhut, um, and not only have no real appreciation in some cases um, for the Moravian tradition, but actually actively disagree with many of the things that Moravianism has historically um, stood for, um, and there they are, be claiming that they are the heirs of historic Moravianism. Um, and they almost certainly aren't, or at least present-day Moravians think they're not. Um, it would be a bit like, imagine if I moved into Lourdes, set up a Christian centre on the edge of Lourdes, um, and said, this is the Lourdes Christian Centre. We are the natural heirs of the spiritual tradition that has its place in this part of the world. However, we don't like the Virgin Mary very much. However, we do really like praying in caves. It's a little bit like that. There are movements out there that would say, um, we are the heirs of Count von Zinzendorf and the Moravians. Um, we don't really understand Moravian theology. We don't like Moravians when we meet them. Um, but we do like praying in shifts over 24-hour periods. Well, that isn't quite um, all there is to be said. So you should mistrust me because I'm not a Moravian. That's my first apology. Um, second, I'm not really a historian, um, or if I am a historian, most of the history I'm speaking about isn't my period, So, but then historians always say that it's not their period, don't they? Um, and my third apology is, I'm giving you, if you like, quite a standard history of the movement. There is a revisionist view, um, an alternative view of Moravian history, that says the Moravians did not really exist until the 1730s. Um, and uh, uh, any link to earlier movements was basically made up by Zinzendorf and Spangenberg, who wrote the accounts of the history of the movement. Um, I think that might be sort of true, but I haven't got time to go into it. So I'm going to tell you the history of the Moravian movement um, in its conventional way, which is to say that I'm going to start with John Wycliffe. Most of you have got a handout. Thankfully, there are more of you here than we ever expected. Um, so uh, not all of you have a handout. If you're watching on YouTube, you certainly don't have a handout. Um, but if you get in touch with me on Twitter, at Zinzendorf for you, I will send you a handout. <laughs> so it starts in this official version of the history with John Wycliffe, 1320 to 1384, probably. Um, and the Lollards. Now, you know, there is um, a biography of John Wycliffe, which is um, arguably um, the most extraordinary biography ever written. Um, and um, it effectively says, by the time you finish the biography, you realize we know almost nothing about the historical John Wycliffe at all. Um, and we don't know what his relationship to this movement, the Lollards, was really at all. Um, and it is entirely credible to say, if you'd gone to John Wycliffe, who was a theologian in the 14th century, and said to him, what's all this about you and the Lollards? He might have said, 
I have nothing to do with them. They're political radical peasants. I'm an Oxford theologian. I don't even talk to them. Or he might have said, yes, I'm a Lollard and proud of it. What they're trying to do in overthrowing the state exactly coheres with my theology of grace. Or he might even have said, what's a Lollard? I've never heard of them. They're in Kent. I'm miles away. We really don't know, but we do know that two generations after the time of John Wycliffe, there were then a group of people who called themselves the Lollards and who did draw on both the theology of John Wycliffe and drew on the political theology, as we now call it, they wouldn't have made that distinction, um, that brought about the Peasants' Revolt. So we don't know if John Wycliffe had particular political views, but we do know that later on there was a group of people who both liked what he had to say about the Bible and the sacraments and thought that the British state needed a little bit of shaking up, to put it mildly, and probably that the nobles, though not the king, needed overthrowing. There seem to have been two themes um, as far as we can work out in Wycliffe's theology. First, that the means of grace should be given to all equally. And uh, that means things like the Bible in English, communion in both kinds, that is bread and wine, and baptism for anyone asking for it, and anyone asking for it for their children. And he was coming into a context in which none of those things were available. And even baptism was withheld from those whose uh, parents were considered not to be leading the right kind of life. Um, you really had to qualify. And Wycliffe seems to have been saying, no, look, let's throw it all out there. Let's have grace on tap through sacraments, through Bible, through all of it. And that goes alongside the idea that it's for God to decide who profits. Um, you'll know that one of the most famous statements that Wycliffe probably made, as I say, the biography says we, all, we know almost nothing about him really, but he probably did say this, um, that a mouse eating the consecrated bread at Holy Communion would eat bread. But he didn't mean God is not present in the sacrament. He meant it is for God to decide who the sacrament does any good to. Maybe, he said, we think, um, God's going to decide anybody receiving it, however their life has turned out, is going to profit from it and receive the body of Jesus. Maybe... God is going to say only those that have certain qualifications are going to profit. But we don't know, and this is crucial, who the worthy people are, because it probably won't be shown in the way they live their lives outwardly. So we just need to throw it out there. It's conditional, but it's God that needs to set those conditions, not us. Babies, let's just baptise them all if the parents <laughs> ask us to. Um, and then God will work out which of them are regenerated and which aren't. And maybe that'll be something to do with the way they grow up and whether they repent. Of. Oddly enough, and he talked at one point, we think, about the story of Samson, maybe there are kids that don't live the sort of life that we are all asking them to in church, and God by his spirit is going to come mightily on them and they are going to be the chosen of God and the respectable people aren't. We don't know. Let's leave it to him and distribute as much grace or as many means of grace as we can. Some quotes, not from John Wycliffe, but from Lollards, who may have been connected to him or might not. Um, there should be equality among all men, sorry, it was the 14th century, save only the king. The clergy should have sufficient endowments to live, and then the excess of their wealth should be divided among the people of the parish and all men should be free and of one condition. Another quote. Are we not all descended from Adam and Eve? And what can lords show why they should be more masters than we are ourselves? 
and then the Lollards disappear. Well, they would, wouldn't they, <laughs> given the circumstances of the time. And it used to be argued that the Lollards had almost no influence on the later Reformation. I mean, they're gone and not heard of way before the Reformation starts happening. And yet, well, let me tell you the areas where the Lollards were strongest. Chester, Bedford, Nottingham, Ely, Rochester, and Essex. Now, let me ask you, 40 years ago, where you would have found clearly Protestant bishops, and they would have been in the same place. Now, is that entirely by accident, or did something go underground? We, we don't know. Um, but we do know that the greatest um, effect of the Lollards and of Wycliffe wasn't a few generations later in Britain, but hundreds of miles away in what we now call the Czech Republic. Jan Hus, and then in later generations, Jan Amos Comenius. They start to put into action some of these Lollard ideas. Grace equally for all, conditional sacraments, but God decides um, who they have any impact on. It's a whole current in Central European Christianity. And remember, it makes no sense really at this point to call them Protestants. We're still talking um, in an era where those, well, for us at least, in an era where that word didn't make any sense. Um, you might compare them to the Anabaptists. You'll know that there was a group we call the Anabaptists, a sort of current within the um, upheavals of religion. They, they, they weren't Lutherans, they weren't Calvinists, they, they were something else. They were a sort of a radical reformation. But of course this stream, and I don't know what to call it really, but let's call it the Lollard stream, this stream was quite different from the Anabaptists, notably because if you had a baby, let's say you're unmarried and you've got a baby, you go to uh, some of your mainstream uh, church authorities and they say, no, we're not baptising your baby, you're not worthy. You go to the Anabaptists, they say, no, we're not baptising your baby because we don't baptise babies at all. That's for those that by repentance and faith have joined the Christian movement. You go to your Lollards and they say, oh yeah, show us your baby. Um, let's get some water out right now. You turn up at uh, a stricter kind of Protestant church and, and they're celebrating communion. Well, they, they have a word with you. Are you the sort of person we should be giving communion to or not? You turn up to your mainstream, well, now of course we would call Roman Catholic Church, um, and uh, go out for communion, and well, you know, it depends really who you've been associating with, quite likely, whether you receive or not. <laughs> you turn up at your Lollards, and they're like, yeah, we've got some bread over here. No, don't go away. We want to give you some wine as well. It's here on tap. They were mostly non-swearing, that is, they read the Sermon on the Mount to mean that you shouldn't have oaths, not all of them, but most of them. Uh, they were mostly pacifist, but not all of them. Uh, they were Peter Baptist, they baptised children as much as possible. Um, and they kept to the three orders, bishops, priests and deacons, and felt that that was quite important as the movement developed. Though what they mean by those terms was really, in time, became quite different um, from what um, Catholics and Anglicans meant uh, by the three orders. It was a sort of multi-denominational movement, and on your handout I've quoted A.J. Lewis, never before, perhaps, in the history of Christian expansion have so successful a band of witnesses ever made so determined and effective an effort to discourage the growth of their own church. Uh, it's not really a recipe for 
success statistically, but, but there was a bit of that, you see, and that's why we don't even quite know what to call them in this era. Um, at some point, a slogan developed in necessary things unity, in non-essentials tolerance, in all things charity. That's probably a slightly later formulation. It probably started talking about ministerials as a category, but, but you get the general idea. Um, that although there's some things you're not going to budge on, you're looking for the areas to be tolerant in as much as possible. Um, they weren't treated enormously well. And by the time you get to Jan Amos Comenius, which is um, the uh, middle of the 17th century, they have dwindled they are on the run. They're in the mountains of um, what we would now call the Czech Republic and Poland. Um, they're, uh, though they're largely, but not entirely, German speaking. Some are Czech speaking. Um, they're keeping it alive, but they're calling themselves the hidden seed. And their idea is, well, they are underground churches. And one day, one day, the hidden seed is going to sprout again. But when will it be? Well, in the 1720s, they move, or some of them move, and some people from all sorts of other movements move as well, and come to the town of Hernhut in southeastern Germany. And there, there's a landowner called Count Zinzendorf. Nicholas Ludwig Graf von Zinzendorf and Pottendorf, which is wonderful. I mean, just his name is enough to start you liking him. Um, he lived 1700 to 1760, and if he'd been here today, he would have said what he tended to say to people in Britain where he lived for a while, just call me Brother Louis. So if uh, the rest of his name is hard to pronounce, you can stick with that. And um, they get, for the first time, a base where they're safe. Zinzendorf is a Lutheran. Um, he grew up among Lutheran pietists. I will try to explain that in a minute, what that means theologically. Um, by now, he's already starting to fall out with the pietists a bit. And in time, he would consider himself the exact opposite of pietism or of pietists um, but he's there he's in a um, current within the Lutheran church that is looking to experiment to explore lay ministry to do things a little bit differently um, even at school he's founded a little order or he and his friends have founded an order called the order of the mustard seed um, they're already starting working together they, they've taken vows together they're looking for opportunities to be kind and to open their arms. They've already got a bit of a multi-denominational feel to them, so that the Order of the Mustard Seed already includes a Roman Catholic cardinal, which, if you think this is the early 18th century, is really quite remarkable. They're already starting to push the boundaries of uh, Lutheranism. And here come this group of religious refugees. And at the first, Zinzendorf just welcomes them because like, well, you know, he's trying to be nice, isn't he? And then in time, he comes to feel that their history could be his history. And a new thing comes about. Now, in order to understand the background, you need to look back to the time before Zinzendorf's birth in both England and Germany, when uh, uh, the continent was reeling from uh, religious wars. And church leaders were fearful that preaching free grace would lead to immorality, anarchy, and still worse, enthusiasm. <laughs> if you had lived in the early 18th century in the UK, the worst thing anyone could say about you was, I think they're an enthusiast. <laughs> um, for
From that moment, and almost without fail, such leaders as Jeremy Taylor and Richard Baxter and William Law and others um, were condemning what they called antinomianism. And that meant downplaying the role of the law in the Christian life. Before 1650, you see, the death of Christ was seen as what was technically called the formal cause of justification. How come I'm right with God? Because Jesus died for me. After 1650, whether you're a Protestant or a Lutheran, certainly a Pietist Lutheran, or a mainline Anglican, or part of the new Anglican holiness movement that was coming into being, then a lively faith is the formal cause. And, I quote from the whole duty of man, true faith includes repentance, and this repentance is in short nothing but a turning from sin to God, the casting off of our former evils, and instead thereof constantly practicing all those Christian duties which God requires of us. The holiness divines, as that group of quite varied theologians were called, were really, really concerned that you need to keep the law. And at the same time, you've got Germany reeling from the wars of religion, and you get pietism um, with some similar theological concerns. That They were looking for a holiness of the heart. And for pietism as well, you needed to be converted. And conversion meant more than accepting Jesus' sacrifice for you. You needed a Buskampf. You needed a struggle for conversion. It needn't be a dateable experience, but it did always have to include some elements in order. There needed to be a protracted deep guilt and fear of a holy God whom we have grievously offended. Next there was despairing repentance, the inner struggle of a terrified, defeated heart. Whoever here perseveres, comes to the breakthrough, to rebirth. And then, the real evidence that these stages were a real struggle for conversion is that there's a verifiable process of sanctification. You are really becoming holy. To quote Podmore, who's um, written uh, extensively on Moravianism, um, the search for moral perfection had come to be seen as the heart of Christianity. And Zinzendorf and his mates, the Moravians, decide this is not the sort of Christianity they want to live with. We are the exact opposite of pietism, says Zinzendorf. Um, you see, they came to the view and perhaps they already held it before Zinzendorf started putting it in writing, we're not exactly sure, that the world was altogether sunnier than the world of the pietists and the English holiness movement, that they lived in the, a world where faith, to quote Zinzendorf, was not a bitter but a danke, not a please but a thank you, not a matter of struggling for something new, but of thanking Jesus for what he'd already done. Again, quoting Zinzendorf, nothing is needed on the side of sinful human beings. Christ has done it all for us. When we seek to partake in the death and cross of Jesus, we don't start by becoming pious. We're made righteous by his merits as sinners, without any help from us you're conscious of sin, do not read the law. It will make you sad. <laughs> Contemplate Jesus' love and it will make you cheerful. You see what I mean? It's a sunnier world. Now you might argue actually all he's doing is radically coming back to Luther. And some people have argued that's exactly what he was doing. But people of his day tended to feel that wasn't the case. That something new and enthusiastic was being born. Um, 
no struggle. Freedom. Grace. And then they came to Britain. You might say the Lollards came home. And uh, you'll have heard of the Fetter Lane community. Um, there it uh, reached London. And of course the best known members of the Fetter Lane um, community were John and Charles Wesley. They'd uh, already met some Moravians and uh, they were to um, feel that there was a cheerfulness even in the face of disaster that they saw there and they, they wanted it. Now, uh, unfortunately, uh, the, method, the early Methodists and uh, uh, Moravians were to fall out, but they had a common origin there at Fetter Lane in a chapel at the back of a house now owned by Roman Abramovich. That's an interesting uh, piece of uh, contemporary trivia, who apparently has been very good to them, because there's still uh, a Moravian community meeting there, and uh, apparently he's, um, he, he's been very helpful. Um, Count Zinzendorf, when he came to, uh, to Britain, lived for some of that time uh, in Ingotstone Hall, not that far from where we're meeting here in Chelmsford. Um, and a new thing came to the UK. In 1749, British Parliament recognised them as a Protestant Episcopal Church. In the debate, they were described as not as narrow nor as stiff as other Protestants. And that kind of expresses something, rightly or wrongly, of how people felt about the Moravians of that time. Fast forward through the years. The Moravian way, and we'll speak about that in what I call part two, where we explore some themes of the Moravian movement. Um, but the Moravian way was um, to try and set up vowed communities, um, mini orders, is my terminology for them, groups of um, believers who lived together close to major settlements sometimes, um, as sort of mission bases. And they uh, um, took root in the 18th century, lived on into the 19th, became effectively another Protestant denomination in the family of Protestant denominations in the 19th century and into the 20th. And fell in numbers, and I think it's probably fair to say in vitality, in the middle of the 20th century. Ah, but something else had happened, you see. Because the Moravian movement had spread across the world. Um, they had spread to North America. They had spread to the Caribbean. They had been the first mass missionary movement from within Protestantism. So by the end of the Second World War, there was a new influx of Moravians into Britain and they came from the West Indies largely. Though there's also three quarters of a million Moravians in Tanzania and some of them made their way here as well. And that gave a whole new life to Moravian churches in England. And I, I, I find that really interesting. There's been a cycle whereby something that, by my way of but oversimplifying the history, came as a movement from England and was lost here at some point in the 15th century, moved into the Czech Republic and through Germany, back to England and to uh, many dominions, was almost lost again in England, not quite, but, but almost lost, and then revitalised by a Caribbean influx. I think that's great. So if you go to a Moravian church today, you will probably find that uh, on your way out you're given um, uh, 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 um, uh, sweet roll with cheese in, that's a Caribbean 
gift for you on the journey. Um, that's great. So why not um, encounter Caribbean life in a Moravian form? And stop there. Well, we I've tried to structure this in three parts. That's my very quick historical overview, and I'll take a couple of questions on this, and then we'll go on to some major themes within the Moravian movement. What was the link between the Lollards and the Peasants' Revolt? Okay, so the link between the Lollards and the Peasants' Revolt, we don't know if there was one at the time of the Peasants' Revolt, but we do know that a couple of generations later, there was a group of people calling themselves Lollards, um, who did draw on the tradition of the Peasants' Revolt. Does that, does that make sense? Um, Lollard is sort of an insult term to Lollard. They did sort of talk and, you know, um, they just keep talking. And it, it was a, um, a, a term that was used to describe the irregular preachers and others who were found um, outside the walls of the established church in the 14th century. And as best we can work out, some of them had a political as well as a religious agenda. And in, in the later Lollard's mind, the Lollards were associated both with John Wycliffe, who gave a theological view of the sacraments for all, and the political thinker. It's an anachronistic term, of course, but the political thinkers um, who were behind the Peasants' Revolt. It seems like some, there was some interplay, or at least a later generation thought that there was an interplay between the two. Thank you. One more question at this point. Yes. Ah, okay, yes, I should have answered that question. Why were they called Moravians? Moravia is um, an area of the Czech Republic where some of the refugees who ended up in Hernhut in southeast Germany came from. Not all of them, um, and indeed some of the movement came um, perhaps, um, you know, um, most notably from Bohemia, which is another bit of the Czech Republic, or from Poland, but um, but they were called Moravian because many of them came from that sort of um, mountainous region. And they escaped over the border where there was relative religious freedom. I, I should say in terms of religious freedom, well, they, they, they weren't burned um, or slaughtered when they got to Saxony. Um, they didn't always find it easy to coexist um, with their Lutheran neighbours. Uh, particularly the pietist movement. Um, and uh, at certain points, um, Zinzendorf and other leaders within the movement were exiled from Saxony because they would, well, I, I call the lecture too much grace. Um, and uh, it is told that one of the early Methodists was to say of the Moravians, they have been so important in our finding of Jesus. It's just that they have altogether too much grace. And I think that's what the pietists felt at all. Or to take the pietist line, there were too few safeguards against it descending into anarchy, political um, insurrection, um, and uh, antinomianism, that is, believing that the law was not to be followed at all. They were enthusiasts, and that was a bad thing to be. Uh, five themes in the Moravian movement. Number one, um, experimentation. Quoting Podmore again, the Brudergemeine, that is, the, um, the, the, the community of brothers, that was the name they used for themselves, the Brudergemeine, was to be a place of experiment, a temporary making visible of the unity of the people of God. So one of the rules that was passed in um, the early Moravian movement 
was that you had to have movable chairs. They actually passed that board. <laughs> Even today, if you go to uh, um, uh, a brethren meeting house, you will not find fixed pews, even in places where there are pews. If you go to the mother church in Henhut, you will discover um, metal, lightweight pews, so that they can be moved during the service. I've got a thumbs up from the dean. <laughs> so that they can be moved during the service to a different configuration. So I'm going to suggest you come over this way and uh, sit in a circle at this point, if you wouldn't mind. Yes, <laughs> Experimentation was part of the raison d'etre of being a Moravian in the 18th century. That was what you became a Moravian for, to a great extent. Services, for example, they completely deconstructed liturgy. So, for example, you would have a service that was nothing but hymns, with like two or three minutes of um, explanation in between, or people telling their story in between, a bit like songs of praise. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the 18th century. Or you would have prophesyings. And in a prophesying, you would get together and be absolutely silent until the Spirit moved somebody to speak. And they could speak, say anything they like, except they were not allowed to speak for more than 15 minutes. Because if you spoke for more than 15 minutes, it was a sign that the Holy Spirit had left you. And that does seem to be quite a good sort of guideline to work with in church life. Uh, they had Bible hours. Now, you may think to yourself, oh, well, the idea of a group of people getting together, talking about the Bible together for an hour, well, that's a commonplace of spiritual life. Well, no, not in the early 18th century it wasn't. And, of course, that had a great impact in what was to become Methodism as well. Um, they had um, at teas. Uh, we have wonderful records from Hermhut. Um, of uh, the community writing to the local bakers saying for our liturgical life we are very concerned that your bums are not big enough <laughs> please make us bigger bums bums that will still be being eaten by the end of our devotional tea because if you kind of already finished your bum and your tea's halfway you know only halfway through um, that people are going to sort of melt away the way I imagine some of you will by before the end of the evening. <laughs> Giving people a big enough bum is the way to keep them engaged. They felt experimentation in all possible ways. And it was for each Moravian member to develop a balanced diet for themselves. So they might say, well, I, I need some Bible, so I'm going to come to a prophesying. And, and I need to worship, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to come to a hymn singing. But, but then next week, well, I, I've, I've had a lot of song worship. Maybe I'll miss out the hymn singing bit, but I will go to the Bible hour. Experimentation rules. And some of you, even as we speak, are thinking, that sounds to me like too much grace. Yes, that's what the Pietists and Methodists said as well. But that was the way that the movement de developed. Secondly, second theme, um, sola gratitudo. Well, that's Latin, isn't it? Um, but it comes from the idea of the solas, um, that um, our, if we live by faith alone, we live by grace alone, we live by scripture alone. And the Moravians said, yes, we, we don't disagree with any of those things. But in addition, we want to live by gratitude alone. You see, everybody wants you to be good. And everyone has a strategy to try and make you good. Um, and if you go to a law school, presumably, you will be told you need to live a good ethical life. Now, why? Well, they will tell you you need to live a good ethical life because you have been to our law, you've been to Birkbeck, 
you are, you are the sort of person that went to Birkbeck College. Um, you're not the sort of person that's going to uh, uh, cheat on your clients or, uh, or, or, or act unethically. In other words, they appeal to your pride, the sort of person you are. Or they'll say, look, we know, we're all capitalists, we do understand, everybody wants to fiddle the system, but don't, because the FSA is really good, and there are um, strategies whereby the state will crack down on you really hard if you don't keep the rules. In other words, they, apply to your, they, they um, uh, appeal to your sense of fear. Or they'll say, you won't be able to live with yourself. It'll get to you somewhere deep inside if you don't live the right sort of ethical life. In other words, they will appeal to your sense of guilt and shame. And Zinzendorf and the Moravians, they said, that's not the way we see it at all. The only reason for living a good and godly Christian life is gratitude for the finished work of Jesus, assisted by the Spirit, and informed by the Word. Nothing else. And you know what the Pietists said, don't you? And you know what the Methodists said, and you know what the English holiness tradition said. They said, if you let people act like that, they're going to take advantage. You can't have that much grace. You have to have a bit of law. Of course, salvation by grace, they would say, absolutely. But then you need the law to kick in a little bit. You need it to have at least three uses. And the Moravians, and certainly Zinzendorf, were saying not in the least of it. Two uses at the most, but, but, but none of this stuff about the law improving you, if you'll only keep it. No. They would say... Well, here's Zinzendorf. The more sure I am of your mercy and love, speaking to God, of course, the more I will be devoted to you and joyfully stand to comply with your every demand. An anonymous Moravian scandalized John Wesley by saying to him, a Christian no more needs to obey the law than an Englishman has to obey the laws of France. You are free from the law. Now, the question is now, now that you're free, now you don't have to keep the law, now, now what are you going to do? And the Moravian answer ideally is, oh my goodness, I am now free from the law, I can do anything. I am so grateful to have been freed from that that I will use my freedom gladly and cheerfully. Cheerfully is such a characteristic word of Moravianism of that day. I am now cheerfully going to devote myself to God. It seems really unrealistic and naive, doesn't it? But it kind of worked. Um, the Moravians scattered across the world. They were... Um, they were imprisoned, they were beaten. One group of Moravians, and actually um, this story seems to uh, be, uh, 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 well, we don't have very good evidence for this story, but, but the Moravians told this story lots, so they believed it was true, uh, even if um, some of the details might be a little bit dodgy. But anyway, they believed that there was a group of Moravian Christians from Hanwood who heard about the island of St. Thomas in the Caribbean, and they felt that God had laid it on their heart to go and bring the good news of Jesus to the slaves who were living there. So they applied for, well, it wasn't visas in those days, but they applied for permission to go, and uh, were refused permission to go there. You couldn't go to the island of St. Thomas, um, Unless you were either a slave owner or a slave. Well, you know, I mean, the, the Moravians could sometimes be a little bit politically compromised, but slave owning was not one of the things they were willing to do. 
So, the story goes, some of them simply sold themselves into slavery so that they could go to that island. The, the, there were so many people who died in the missionary expansion of the Moravian church that missionary service was colloquially known as the big dying or the great dying. That's what you were signing up for. And hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them went out around the world. So for them at least, a naive view that you don't have to do anything led to a glad and cheerful gratitude that led them to be motivated to do all sorts. I'm going to move on. Number three, third theme, a spirituality of stillness, wounds, and sacrificial mission. Um, an anonymous Moravian once said to John Wesley, it's as if you're bending yourself over the back of a chair to receive God's favour. Just kneel and receive and say thank you. Now, given Wesley's rather complicated psychological state, that was probably not the most helpful thing to say to him. But you see what they're getting at, don't you? You don't have to struggle, Mr. Wesley. You, you, Jesus did it. He just did. Just look, just cheerfully accept it and carry on. You'll remember that a uh, uh, Moravian preacher said to Wesley, J just preach faith till you have it. It's just, it'll just come. Stop, stop worrying about it. Um, even before the time of Zinzendorf, the Moravian slogan was, our lamb has conquered, let us follow him. And they had a logo. The logo, we think, dates um, to the 17th century, which is a lamb with a banner on its shoulder. The litany of the wounds. Now, I should say, if you go to a Moravian church today, it is extremely unlikely that the litany of the wounds will now be in use. But if it was, it would say things like this. Great wound in the side of Jesus. You are the gate of heaven. You've opened the way for us to be in Christ, close to his heart. Great wound in the side of Jesus. You are the gate of heaven. The way in past the torn veil into the Holy of Holies. The birth canal of the new birth and so on. Um, you can see the enthusiast bits in there, can't you? In fact, it does seem a bit pathological at times, if I'm honest. And um, I'm in both senses an enthusiast for Moravianism. And even I can see it, it can go a little bit far. I mean, without developing this too far... If the wound in Jesus' side is a birth canal, and we see where the metaphor comes from, don't we? New birth through the wounds of Jesus. Okay, got it. Okay, and then you're a very artistically rich community, so you want to draw that image. Okay. So you have enormous numbers of people who are spending enormous amounts of artistic talent and time drawing Jesus' birth canal... Can you see where you're starting to get into areas that is making your neighbouring denominations a little bit anxious? <laughs> right there. Um, and the whole wounds thing, quite apart from the birth canal thing, the whole wounds thing, you know, it's an almost pathological interest in the wounds of Jesus. And yet, you see, they wanted to shake people up a bit. They wanted to tell people that it's not just Jesus was crucified, died on the cross, cross, crucified, though those words seem so weak and commonplace to us now. He had wounds, he suffered, there was blood. But still, it may have gone a little bit too far. Um... But it worked in sacrificial mission. Kamerhoff, another early leader. The distinguishing mark of Moravian mission is this. No one thinks I'm doing this for me. And Zinzendorf. You must be content to suffer, to die, and to be forgotten. 
Do not use energy for introspection that would be better employed preaching the gospel or serving the poor. Don't worry, Jesus has already dealt with all your sins and stuff. Never mind about any moral striving. That energy is now available to do something more useful. Fourthly, um, so my f first theme in uh, uh, Moravian thoughts was experimentation. My second was gratitude alone. The third was a spirituality of stillness, of wounds, and a sacrificial mission. My fourth is community. There's no Christianity without community, some zips and all. The original church is the Holy Trinity, and it was born on earth when Jesus said to Mary, Behold your son, and to John, Behold your mother. So there are four ways that Christians existed, according to Moravians, in the world. There were orders. Orders were sort of international bodies. The order of the mustard seed is the best known. It could contain people from many different denominations, and that was fine. Um, they didn't live together. They were dispersed, but they'd taken vows. And they kept in touch with each other by correspondence, wherever possible. And uh, I've given you a website address on your handout, www.mustardseedorder.com, if you want to see the present existence of one of them, um, right there. Secondly, if you, the, apart from um, international orders, there are locally led parish churches. Um, those who discern that God is calling them to simply remain as members of their parish churches are not lesser Christians. Their whole lives are Gottesdienst, that is, worshipful service to God, said Zinzendorf. And Rota, um, one of uh, uh, his uh, colleagues, put it like this. How very unfair it would be if everything depended on one or two poor clergy people. For number one, no one person would have all the gifts needed by a whole community. And number two, even if he had all gifts, time and strength would be lacking to do all that was needed for each member. But where members are committed to one another, and each one serves the other with that gift which each received from the Lord for the common good, then can the whole body be built up. When uh, Moravian communities were established in different countries, Generally speaking, Hanhut, the headquarters, refused to send them um, a paid pastor. They said, no, actually each, each parish church needs to be locally led by the people there. Now, this didn't work out well at Fetter Lane, it has to be said. Um, because there the people at Fetter Lane wrote to Hanhut, please send us a pastor, they said. We're, we're, we're here as a church. And Hanhut wrote back saying, no, we will not direct you. Um, we, will, uh, we, we, we will give you support and serve you, but we will not send you a director. You're going to have to work out among yourselves who your focal minister is. They don't use the word focal minister at that time, but um, that's maybe a contemporary example of this. Now, that didn't work out well because there was somebody in that local church who felt he would be the ideal focal minister <laughs> for Fetter Lane, and his name was John Wesley. And unfortunately, not all his colleagues thought the same, and it all turned out a little bit messily. But, but you see the principle, locally led parish churches. Thirdly, you've got the Ortsgemeinen. Literally, that communities of place, and I've translated that as mini orders, groups of people that they're like the international orders, but they live locally or close to each other. Sometimes they live literally in community, um, and uh, you could have kind of community houses. All the single men live together, all the single women live together separately, um, the married couples, there's sort of child care arrangements, it's kind of a kibbutz, um, and sometimes it's not quite that community living, but, but they're close to one another. Um, again, Zinzendorf, as in every quarter of the world where we establish ourselves, 
there are usually 80 to 100 persons in our economy who eat our bread, but who after the manner of the Rechabites are not inclined to fix their abodes or carry on their affairs for their own benefit, but at all times be at liberty and serve their neighbours after their capacity. This is our plan for the kingdom of God, not first to bring words, but first to show what kind of people you are, so that the locals ask, who makes such people as these? Uh, we are now almost sure that St. Francis of Assisi did not say, preach the gospel, if necessary, use words. He did not, as far as we can tell, say it. But Zinzendorf did say this, so if any of you need a quote to uh, throw into a conversation that makes the same sort of positive point, it's right there. <laughs> they did then go on to use a very large number of words. <laughs> and then, finally... They are the Pilgergemeinde, pilgrim communities, groups of um, paid leaders, supported leaders, who were not the, excuse me, the pastors of individual local churches. They work together in teams. I'm calling them unit teams. I don't know why I choose that word, but anyway, <laughs> um, they are groups of, um, uh, of we would say, ordained leaders who are not attached to any one church but a troubleshooting and supporting and building up the local teams that run the local churches. Now, the uh, Pilgrim communities came about, it has to be said, largely by necessity, because Zinzendorf kept getting chucked out of places and exiled. So he had to be fairly mobile around the place. But still, they made a virtue of it. Um, and so the mobile headquarters teams winded their way around the world. Fifthly and finally, among the sort of major themes, a radical equality. Women uh, were um, given, I would love to say they were given equal place. They weren't, but they were given much more equal place than any other religious movement that we know of at the time, except possibly Quakerism. Um, they're certainly the deputy leader of the worldwide um, Moravian movement, who, um, uh, you know, was um, was a woman, um, and it seems that within the, uh, the the councils of the movement, she was given equal place um, with Zinzendorf. Interestingly, they were not married. Zinzendorf was married to somebody else. Um, uh, so it wasn't like a sort of the, the married couple were the heart of it. Um, two different people, one man and one woman, seem to have been sort of co-leaders, but as far as anyone else outside the movement was concerned, Zinzendorf was the leader really, so I don't want to oversell that bit. Um, here's a doxology from the 18th century. Praise to God our Father, praise to God our Husband, Praise to God our Mother, praise to the three in one. The feminine in God was quite important. The Holy Spirit was always spoken of in the feminine form. Interestingly, that's little done in Moravian churches today, but it's there in the heritage, and um, uh, there's the opportunity to embrace it once again. The closer to God our souls are, said Zinzendorf, the less we will notice the difference between male and female souls. Now, I did say that Zinzendorf was seen as the leader of the Moravian movement. Well, it was. And in personality, really, in effect, he was. But in theory, he wasn't. It was a church, in theory, without hierarchy. Even though it had bishops, priests, and deacons, the bishops had very little authority. Even to this day, a Moravian bishop... Um, has much less personal authority um, than their counterparts in other churches. Um, and if you ask who the chief elder of the Moravian church is, well, that's an interesting story. Because um, uh, back in the uh, uh, middle of the 18th century, they um, had an election for who their chief elder ought to be. 
There were various good candidates, but the trouble is nobody could get a majority, and it was getting a little, you know, it was dragging on. It's like the Sistine Chapel. They, 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 they couldn't come to a conclusion. And then somebody wrote the name Jesus on a ballot paper. And oddly enough, Jesus won a majority vote and was installed as chief elder of the Moravian Church. And, and interestingly enough, nobody's dared stand against him in the new election since. Um, so at uh, many Moravian meetings through the years, um, a seat has been set in the chairman or chairperson position that nobody sits in as a sign that Jesus um, is presiding. Now I know that that's a symbolic thing. That somebody still has to sort of chair the meeting and get through. But still, it probably matters to a way of doing church that things tend to be done by teams and by consensus more than by personal authority. Um, and uh, you will tend to find a number of people who together make decisions rather than it being based in one person alone. Okay, I'm going to stop again there. Any questions on those five themes that I've tried to draw out? Yes. Um, in many of the things you've said, there's sort of tangential sort of contacts with the Diocese of Chubbs. Now, I don't know I'm being a little bit silly, yeah, so, yes. so, so... I don't know this is intentional. Yeah. Of course. But I, what I want to say, ask you is, what do you think, on the basis of your understanding of Raven, that their message is to the Diocese of Chubbs? Oh my goodness, okay. What is the message of the Moravians to the Diocese of Chelmsford? Well, you'd have to ask them that, that there is at least one Moravian church within the Diocese of Chelmsford in East London, so Come you on, can ask them. I, I, I know what you're asking. Yes, absolutely. Well, it seems to me um, that there are at least three things that, that are important to me. I'm, look, whether they're important to anyone else is, is up to that. To me, there's three important things. One is we really need to move back to an era, an era of experimentation, it seems to me. Um, I think we should all be moving chairs and pews lots. That's, that's my view. And moving things around. I think we need to renegotiate the Sunday contract. I don't think it has to be worship as it is at present. I think it can be deeply different from that and be really good. Um, and I think even if it fails, it's worth experimenting. And then if you discover that the experiment was, was a failure, you've learned something. Um, so, so that's the first thing, I think. Secondly, I am absolutely committed um, to the principle that local churches should be led by local people. Um, I think we have suffered far too long. Actually, just me talking, it's not anyone else talking. I think we've suffered from far too long to churches being dependent. When the vicar leaves, it's as if, oh my goodness, we can't do anything here until from the outside somebody else comes in um, and gives us our new direction. No, I, I personally, I would much rather see a system in which each church has a ministry team leading it with a focal minister who is somebody who is right there on the spot from the local church, who is, as much as we can say this, permanently there. And then the role of those that come in from the outside, like the pilgrim communities of Moravianism, becomes to build up that local team, to train, to encourage, to inspire. Uh, that seems to me to be both um, a more hopeful way for the 21st century and a more biblical way. Because if you look back to um, the way that the church grew in the Eastern Mediterranean, you've got teams of people like Timothy and Titus and Priscilla and others and Paul working together. Um, none of them become the pastor of a local church. None of them become a vicar, 
and settle down. From time to time, they're troubleshooters. Time to time, Titus is said, can, can you go to the churches in Crete and make sure that um, uh, they've got properly functioning ministry teams, please, um, and support them and, 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 and show them how to live and, and then pull out and leave them to it and, and write them a letter from time to time and, 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 and do the rest of it. So that seems to me the biblical way to operate. Um, you've got Paul. So Paul, for example, um, ends up um, uh, in, oh dear, I think it's Ephesus. If I'm wrong, I apologize. Um, and uh, he, he says, I couldn't, um, uh, you know, we're told Paul, Paul could, no, it's Cohen. There we are, it's Cohen. And, and, and Paul says, I couldn't um, preach the gospel there, though a door was opened for me, because Titus wasn't there. And we want to say, hang on, Paul. Uh, it's in 2 Corinthians. So it probably wasn't Corinth, was it? Anyway, wherever he was. We want to say, hang on, Paul. Paul. We think of you as an individualist. We think you'll just go and preach the gospel wherever you happen to be at the time. He says, no, 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 I needed Titus to be with me. So it seems like we've got teams, apostolic teams, unit teams, if you like, um in operation, who are supporting local churches led by local teams. And I think that's really good. And thirdly, sorry? Did he go to Corinth from Athens, where he was struggling? Probably, yes. Yes, yeah, no, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm not quite clear on the chronology of the New Testament, if I'm honest. Um, and then thirdly, I want to say this whole thing of gratitude alone is really important. Because I meet people who have such guilt, and it's the churches that have put the guilt on them. The law has been so strong, and it's been different kinds of law in different sort of churches, but there's been an awful lot of law around, and I think a little bit more grace would come in really well. Um, you, you must be the same as me. You meet people in your churches who basically believe that they're rubbish and worth nothing, and can't do anything and they hope, they have a pious hope that maybe at the end of the day they will just about be acceptable to Jesus but it's no more than that and I think the Moravians would say to us, that is absolute rubbish, it needs to be blown out of the water, it is absolutely untrue, you are already accepted in Christ you have come in, I mean in a Moravian church We'd have come in, in, of that era, you'd have come in possibly through a red door, I didn't provide a red door dripping with paint today, as a sign that you come in through the wounded side of Jesus. And when you come through that door, you are in Christ. And everyone's welcome in, it's, it's not a, a, a select group. Everyone can come in and they can be in Christ coming in through the wound in his side. And if you're in Christ, you are perfect. If you're in Christ, you are holy. If you're in Christ, everything has been done for you that you need. There's no more striving. There's no more anything. Stillness in the Moravian tradition. It doesn't mean stillness like, don't be too noisy. It means stillness like, cease from all the ways that we try to make ourselves acceptable and accept that God has already accepted us in Christ. Um, that isn't a quote from the Moravians, and I have a feeling I'm slightly quoting Paul Tillich, and he definitely wasn't an 18th century Moravian, but still, that's the principle that seems to me so, so important um, for all of us to get our head around. There we are. So I'm an enthusiast. Third, my third part. Um, just talking about the Moravian movement and the diaspora today. Um, diaspora is a Moravian word. The diaspora is a way of describing those who are not Moravians but who feel something stir in their hearts and sort of have a kind of attachment to it while remaining in their own denominations. Um, and um, I guess that there are a group of people like that worldwide, and I've given you a, a, a website with a bibliography. Um, 
there's some really good stuff on there. And there are movements, in particular 24-7 prayer, and I've mentioned a biography of uh, Zinzendorf that is written by Phil Anderson, who's very much associated with that movement. Um, there, there, there are some of these things that are energizing Christians today. And I went to Hanhut on my sabbatical. It's there in uh, uh, South East Germany. That is in the old, what used to be East Germany. And I had a number of surprises when I got there. Probably because I hadn't done my research well enough before I went. One of the surprises I got is that that is both at the same time a denominational headquarters and a place for adults with learning difficulty to have supported living in roughly equal numbers. Imagine, if you will, that Church House in Westminster was also a large community. Um, it's a bit like that. And you think to yourself, how on earth did that come about? I mean, how would, you know, that, that doesn't seem an obvious sort of organisational move. And, uh, of course, the answer is that under communism, the local Moravian school um, was not in favour. So what happened was that the people, I guess we would say, special needs children from the whole surrounding area were sent there. Um, really as, as what was seen by the authorities as a negative move um, to try and make sure that the school was, as they would have seen it, unsuccessful. But actually it became really quite successful. And when that group of children, and in the end it was almost entirely that group of children left school, then they needed something and the local Moravian communities built places for them to live and gave care and they developed the idea that maybe some people could double up as church bureaucrats and as carers um, for adults needed, needing supported care. I arrived at Hanhut my first evening there. I went across to the, uh, the, the, the meeting hall, not as it happens, the historic church, but a, a more modern building, and, and there was a worship service about to get, begin, and I was uh, invited in. Um, I don't know what I was expecting. Um, I, I guess I was expecting German hymnody. Um, what I got was hundreds of people with learning difficulties bringing candles to the front singing in German translation um, the song Everything I Do, I Do It For You to Jesus. Well, that was, I mean, that, that was quite a, quite a way to, 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 to conclude a, a, a pilgrimage journey to, 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 to Hanhut. There it is. Now, I've said that Hanhut is the mother church and the world headquarters. Actually, it's a very dispersed denomination. And there is very little um, control or even coordination that goes on for the church in Tanzania from the church buildings in Hanhut. Um, okay, I'll, I'll quickly move through a few other things about uh, the Moravian movement today. Um, people know about watchwords. Many people who are influenced by the Moravian movement are sent each, uh, either by the book or the, nowadays uh, we're sent it electronically, each day some Bible passages to read and uh, a paragraph and in different places that could be uh, words of a song or a poem or some cases it's a prayer, different provinces do it differently. Um, it's kind of Bible reading notes, except that this is Bible reading notes that have been going since the early 18th century. Um, and that's the sort of way that people are bound together across the world, really, in that way. Um, and you're given Bible, you could read just those verses, or you could read longer sort of passages of Scripture, and if you do, you'll get through the Bible in two and a half years. Again, there are many... Bible reading plans like that, but this one has some claim to a sort of historical uh, primacy. 
There are Christians around the world that are praying in ways that are um, inspired by the Moravian tradition. Um, not so much prayer meetings, though actually they did have prayer meetings as well, as um, prayer watches. So all you do is you have a list of times, say a 24-hour period, um, and people sign down, yeah, I'll pray from um, 1 till 2 in the afternoon, I'll pray till two, from 2 till 3 in the morning so that there's always somebody praying through the 24 hours in whatever location has been chosen. Um, that was, um, went on for a hundred years in Hanhut, during which time um, three times as many missionaries were sent out across the world as there were living in the community, because people came, joined the community, were sent out and others came to replace them. And it's been restarted in the 1950s and continues to this day, all coordinated through the International Unity at Helmhut. Um, in 1998, the Fetter Lane Agreement was signed, um, which gives um, as close integration as possible between the Church of England and the Moravian Church. Um, and that stands, it, it's, it's one of the closest denominational agreements. There's an interchangeability, for example, that doesn't exist with Methodism there, though there's some complications as well. Um, but, um, but there's a very close relationship, and... Um, to be fair, since there were relatively few Moravian churches in, 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 in Britain, perhaps there was, uh, it may have been felt that there was less at stake than in conversations with a larger British denomination. Uh, we have all, well I say we have all, I shouldn't assume that, many of us have been excited uh, about the vote this week um, for uh, women to be ordained to the Episcopate in the Church of England. It is worth noting that the bishop of the Moravian Church um, in England is Bishop Beth, and she has been um, since um, the, uh, uh, the early years of this century. Um, uh, so, you know, it, it may be not quite as radical a move as uh, some, of us, uh, some of us might think. Um, I always thought it was odd that the media never really covered Bishop Beth much. I don't quite get that, but maybe nobody told them. And maybe uh, it won't be long before we've got some of our own to, to share the media burden anyway. Um, and just to finish, well, I think I already said this in uh, the answer to an earlier question. <coughs> if there's one thing I think the, the Moravian tradition can teach us. It is that you can never have too much grace. But proper grace. Really knowing what Jesus has done and being overwhelmed by it. Not gratitude like sort of, oh, he's done so much I can never pay him back. No, no. Gratitude that is glad. Contemplating the cross of Jesus is not sad, said one uh, Moravian writer, because the crucified Jesus is not dead. And the wounds on the body of Jesus can be seen now on his glorious risen body and inspire us with cheerful gratitude. I think we've got time for about one more question, maybe two. Yes. Um, talking about grace, I, I'm thinking about Dietrich Bonhoeffer during the Second World War and costly grace. So how did these Moravians get on with Hitler? Ah, oh, that's a really good question. How did the Moravians get on with Hitler? Yes. Um, I'm probably not qualified to answer it. It is a good question. Um, <laughs> I mean, the bottom line is that um, the confessing church drew from all the German denominations, including the Moravian church, but drew on a minority of each of those churches. 
and I, I'm not aware that it was a higher proportion of the Moravian than of other churches. That's the, um, I don't know if anyone knows more about 20th century German history than, than I do. Um, I think it's interesting, I mean, Bonhoeffer himself um, was somebody, um, like Schreimacher before him, was somebody with a Moravian heritage in part, though of course he was a Lutheran pastor. Um, so I think some Moravians would claim that he, some of his ideas drew directly on their thoughts, but that might be sort of pushing it a bit. Well, he was born in Breslau, wasn't he? Which is now Poland, so he was more into the area. In his maybe, place. maybe. I don't want to overclaim. <laughs> yeah. A sort of twist on that, on that very good point would be, did the experience of the Second World War and all of that um, at all dent the Moravian sunny view of the world? Ah, very interesting. I think the sunny view of the world of the Moravian Church was already very greatly dented um, by the end of the 18th century. Um, something happened um, that regularised the Moravian Church after the death of the first generation of leaders, people, first generation of leaders of the renewed Moravian Church, people like Zinzendorf. And uh, uh, his successor, Spannenberg, wrote an account of their history that removed all the difficult, experimental, slightly uncomfortable bits. And the bits about the feminine in the Holy Spirit, and the bits about a female co-leader, and the bits about not, you know, and it, and it really kind of made its peace with pietism in particular to the point that today we can look at um, Moravianism and say, well, at some point it, it ceased to be the opposite of pietism and became a sort of pietism. So I think the sunniness had already gone a bit um, and basically under pressure, and of course they were under massive pressure and, 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 and who can blame them for compromising a little bit, but, but I think what sort of happened was um, yeah, a sense that, that they kind of wanted leaders um, and a culture like all the other nations around them had. Uh, and um, I'm aware I'm speaking on YouTube and uh, there may, somebody may click on who's a sort of a, uh, a proper Moravian unlike me and be utterly incensed <laughs> that I have dared to say this. But I do dare to say that I think the Moravian movement became just a tiny bit more pedestrian uh, at some point. And now it's got the chance to reclaim its heritage and experiment again and do a little bit more. They called it sifting time. We, we could all do with a little bit of sifting time, it seems to me. Um, well, Andy, I think we just draw the evening to a close. It's been wonderful, and mm -hmm. um, particularly that sense of, of the great gratitude. Uh, we come across people who are perhaps burned by guilt or, or just, um, yeah, feel, feel it's all a bit... The, the angst thing uh, pops up a lot. And I think to be reminded of that need for, for, for that basic stance of, of gratitude. And, and uh, Hugh's question about how that might play into our church life today is a really good thing that perhaps we could all ponder. I'm sure indeed you've fed through all sorts of thoughts, so I, ha I hope you have, to, to the Bishop and the Diocese. Um, thank you so much. It's been a really you. interesting evening. Can we express our... <laughs> Traditionally, every Moravian service um, would end with the words, Christ and Him crucified remain our confession of faith. Christ and him crucified remain our confession of faith. So can I ask you to stand if you're able? Should we say that together? Christ and him crucified remain our confession of faith.